about Leon Silvers, that's something that really kind of gets me kind of going as well because I've always felt like outside of Terry Lewis and Jimmy Jam, yeah. he was the producer of the 1980s, no doubt about it. in my opinion. No doubt about it. He set the pace along with Brother Kashif later on. You know what I mean? Those brothers really set the pace, but Leon Silvers was the one, 1978 through 83, 84, he was the man. And there was no doubt about it. Terry Lewis and uh, Jimmy Jam went to L.A. to work with him because they knew that he was the one who was taking it to the future. And he uh, he definitely, uh, he's one of the most underrated individuals. And L.A. and Babyface also was oh, underneath absolutely. the tutelage. They were watching, believe me, because mm -hmm. Reggie and Vincent Calloway, right. the Midnight Star, right. who was actually on Soul Eye Records as That's well, right. was producing the stuff like Body Talk and just different things mm -hmm. uh, that was going on with Midnight Star. And uh, Reggie Calloway, I think, became so busy at the particular time that he told Babyface, and I think you guys you can, can kind of get in there and do it yourself. So you have all these different things that was going on at Soar, and it's actually really personal for me because you know, but I lived in LA. I lived down there twice, and I lived down there when they used to record up at the studio called Studio Masters, right. and it was up on Beverly Boulevard, and uh, they would take the stuff over to Capitol, I think, or maybe Westlake Audio and Master it, mm -hmm. but John Wood, was a white jazz player. He actually owned Los Angeles Records. And Studio Masters is where everybody, you know, Shalimar, Dynasty, Lakeside, Kerry Lucas, everybody you can think of recorded there. And uh, one of the things that we haven't talked about, let's get into it right now, is the hits. Right, absolutely. The hits. Uptown Festival. It's all the way live. Um, second time around. All of these things start to explode during that time. 77, 78, 79, Whispers in the Beat Goes On, broke out in 1980. I mean, we just began clap. to platinum, absolutely. We weren't talking about just simple um, gold records. We were talking about platinum records, platinum hits, record after record, single after single. Shalomar's Big Fun album, which featured the second time around, absolutely. right in the socket. I owe you one. Things oh, such man. as that. Absolutely. Um, Lake Sun's Fantastic Voyage. Yep, that's Your right. Your Love is on the One. Um, and they didn't have a lot of one. artists. Right. But they had right. a lot they of pop. Right. Exactly. Right. And the, the, the staff writers that they had there, mm -hmm. Daniel Myers, absolutely. Kevin Spencer, absolutely. William Shelby, mm -hmm. Stephen Shockley. And matter of fact, Stephen Shockley is the guitar player for Lakeside, who did a lot of writing with Lakeside as well. And uh, when you listen to his guitar style on uh, And the Beat Goes On, Basically, Michael Jackson's people was copying that on Billy Jean. You know that right. the, 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 it's right. the same lick, it's just Absolutely. changed around. Absolutely. So there was a yeah. lot of stuff that was actually really going on at Soul Arm. A lot of things that were going on, and people forget people who were under the umbrella, as you mentioned, the Cowboys. And Babyface came from under that umbrella, and things were just going on. Like I said before, when uh, Jam and Lewis left Minneapolis, they went to LA. They didn't go to LA just to own humbug. They went to LA to work with who was hot at that time. And as I mentioned before, Kashif was in New York. Kashif went to LA. He was a former member of BT Express. Absolutely. BT Express. To study that sound and to study how those hits were being made. He took it back to New York and then you get your Evelyn Champagne Kings, you get your Howard Johnson, you get your Kashif, you understand? They were all following the formula of solo namely Dick Griffin and Leon Silvers. In particular, it's funny, real quick, we're gonna to get to some entertainment, but mm -hmm. he mentioned Howard Johnson mm -hmm. by way of Kashif, by way of Solar, in reference to the sound Absolutely. and the, the formatting. Um, Howard Johnson had the original version of Jam Tonight it's before Freddie right. Jackson did it. Freddie absolutely Jackson was right. you know, kind of working with them. It was called Jam Song, but the hit off the album was So Fine, So Bad. Fine, You Blow My Mind, which was like a, a, a whispers thing, period. Right. Period. Let's get to some solar yeah. music and show you yeah. what we're talking about, and we'll be back. From uh, what Brother Scotty has said uh, from the Whispers, was a avid student of Barry Gordy. Yeah. So he followed most of the things that Barry Gordy had done before him, and you know he set the pace. And Barry Gordy, of course, was the prototype. And uh, when Dick Griffith came along, he began to really follow that formula with a few omissions, of course, but he did uh, he did his best to follow the formula of what Barry Gordy had done, and he was very successful, extremely successful. He probably was the only black independent businessman in the music business during that time who had success monetarily uh, on the charts in the various avenues. Dick Griffin was the man at that time. Yeah, and you know, you gotta put everything within the context of the time of what we're talking about, mm -hmm. because, uh, yeah. 
the avenues for media is not like what it is now. You know, I, you know, to go platinum and to go gold, even just to go gold during that time, just to get on pop radio, you know, popular radio. You know, he stayed true to who he was, and that—that that was the thing I think I most really, really loved about <coughs> Solar. Um, and when I think about his um, genius and also doing something that nobody else did, which he allowed an all-female band, Absolutely. which was a climax, Absolutely. to actually have an avenue to express themselves, and that was a whole different type of deal. You, you know, we really had not saw that, not like that before, when you start no. thinking about yeah. not just the funk stuff like the men on pause, meeting in the ladies' room, um, but classics like I'll Miss You, which will get you played on any radio. You could be That's like right. soft rock or whatever That's it may right. be. Um, yeah. You know, and yeah. like I said, the whispers. When you think about just him being able to have the mindset to say, you know what? Okay, it would be easy to have a blue magic or temptations or whatever, but these cats have been here, not really had any real serious hits, you know, you know, black hits or whatever, but no real serious hits and to say, you know what? You guys can help me, I can help you, we're going to all go to the next level. And I think that in 1980, they really exploded. You could kind of see it kind of simmering with the Headlights LP with Let's Go All yep, The Way. Exactly. And um, Olivia. Olivia Lost and Turned Out. Nobody was making music like that. But when they got to the Headlights LP, uh, not Headlights, but the self-entitled Whispers LP, um, yeah. I think everything kind of started to really change for them because right. uh, Lady... <clears throat> And the beat goes on, and you know, a song for Donnie. Yeah. I mean, just, just, yeah. that was a hell of a time. That was a, a, a hell of a time. Interesting thing about that period of time is that the actual, the greatest albums that were made on that label really didn't come until later on when the label was kind of on the decline. When you had no parking on the dance floor, the look album by Shalimar, and things like that. So they were actually. Um, created a new crop of producers and writers and things like that later on. And it really uh, came to fruition in the uh, late 80s and early 90s when Solar was defunct, when Babyface and L.A. And let's not forget Snoop, D Dr. Dre, you know, Deep Cover. Exactly. Deep Cover was the last, you know, exactly. that was on Solar, you guys. Exactly. It was on Solar Records. That's right. But I don't want to get too lost because you mentioned an album that's real dear to me. I was living in the projects and no parking on the dance floor was out. That's right. And you talking about an album that rivaled Thriller. That's absolutely true. You, you look at any of those Jets, Soul Brothers top 20s, I'm talking about for like months, not just like an issue here, an issue there. I'm talking about like probably a nine, 10 month period. Thriller was number one, no parking on the dance floor album was a close, consistent number two. That's right. I, I remember <clears> like park, yesterday. No parking was number two behind. Uh, thriller for eight weeks in a row. Yeah. Giving Michael Jackson a run for his money. Oh, he got a run for yes. his money. And that album left singles that was not really Absolutely. released as singles because Electricity That's right. was not a single off that album. That should have been a I mean, that album Slow was James loaded. Well. Absolutely was. They could have released seven, seven singles off of that album. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, we're talking about a great period of time. Then later on, when the Look album came out, um, Leon Silvers completely changed Shalomar's sound. And that was, of course, the last time we heard from that group of Sheldon, you understand? But when he changed their sound and gave us Dead Giveaway, and gave us Over and Over, he created a new wave funk movement with that album. And then, you, you know, also uh, being attentive to a lot of the different sounds that might have been happening, like on the, the new wave type of sound, without necessarily copying. Absolutely. It's just, his antennas were definitely up. He, Leon was a bad, Leon was bad. Leon was yeah. real, but, and you know, a hell of a bass player. And then when you start thinking, I think about something that you used to often tell me on Soul School, we, we would be doing uh, solar things over the years. Um, you was uh, running down to me that, you know what, Dynasty wasn't nothing but another avenue. Is it? Shallow Is it? material. It? You know, but instead of the, the two dudes and the female, it was Kevin Spencer and, and, and William Shelby, and then, you know, Nigel Beard now, man. Yeah, so. absolutely. That's all it was. It was just another avenue for Shalimar to get their material out. But instead of giving it to Shalimar, he created another band and actually joined the band later on. You know what I mean? So, Piece of the Rock, yeah. Satisfied, yeah. which we're going to show a little bit later on in the mm -hmm. show. Do Me Right, I Just Begun to Love You, Love in the Fast Lane. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. It was a time period. I want to bring up Lakeside again. Um, 
And I feel so, as I said before, close to this situation because I remember them just being local around LA before, I mean, when they were on ABC, when, uh, before Norman Whitfield had them, when they were just tearing up Mavericks Flats and the Tolo Experience and all these just different places um, yeah. out in LA. Matter of fact, at that time, Lakeside was doing a lot of the OJ's material. They even had any, they were trying to be the OJ's, man. They had this Cadillac with these tenant windows. They would like pull up at Mavericks Flats, jump out like they were superstars. It was them, and then also James Ingram had a group called Revelation Funk at that time. And uh, right. he, 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 tell you how bad Revelation Funk was. <laughs> Revelation Funk was so bad in LA that people would see them pull up at the gigs and if they were like kind of gonna open or close, they would turn around and just leave. And he wasn't even singing at the time. Um, he was just a keyboard player before right. Quincy found him. So, you know, it, it, when I think about Solar, all of that stuff starts to resonate with um, Jody yeah. Wiley and Jeffrey going to Dorsey High School, and uh, you know I was going to Mount Vernon, which is now Johnny Cochran Academy. And uh, I think about Soul Train being shot down at a KTLA Channel 11 down at Metro Media, right. and uh, before it was at Paramount. So Solar Records encompasses so much. It just brings so much out of me uh, when I start thinking about it. But Lakeside, um, <laughs> when you start thinking about the funk groups of the 70s, late 70s, going into the 80s, you know, of course, Confunction was there, the Gap Band, of course, was there, just different people, Al Hudson, One Way, yeah. and all these just different people, but I always <coughs> thought that Lakeside was a group that got really lost underneath the count, and uh, I thought one of the things that clearly separated them, much like um, a lot of the other fun groups, but they had their own niches the way that they did balance. Right. And I think about right. Say Yes, Give It Into Love, the reworking of uh, the Beatles classic, I Want to Hold Your Hand. And to tell you the truth, I didn't even like it when mm -hmm. I first heard it. Mm -hmm. It took me to see them doing that live before I could really hear where they were with that, man. And, uh, Bullseye later, bro. Oh, Bullseye. Oh, man. Yeah, yeah Bullseye. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Uh, you know, a final thought on Lakeside? Yeah, the Lakeside Express. Huh? They were uh, Solar's answer to Slide and Family Stone, basically. Bump and Delic and all of that self-contained group. Um, Norman Whitfield had his hands on them, but Norman Whitfield wanted them to be Rolls Royce Part Two, and they had no uh, they had no feelings for that. They didn't want to do it, so they got rid of Norman Whitfield. Dick Griffey got a hold of them. And Dick Griffey told them, "Yo, if you want to be an independent band, be a self-contained band, come here and mess with me, and I'll give you that opportunity." And they did, and they were, as we, as we talked about with Shadow Mars, we talked about the Whispers, they were not third tier because they also had hit after hit after hit for a five or six year period. They weren't languishing, they, they were in the mix with Cameo, they were in the mix with all those, the Gap bands and all those groups were around during that time. And uh, they are now living legend. I think we have two, two groups of Lakeside at this point. Yeah, Mark Wood has a group and um he registered the name, I guess, trademarked the name. Okay. And then you have the other nine members, um, Otis Stokes, T. Meyer McCain, um, uh, who was it? Thomas Shelby is back mm -hmm. with them. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to think. Norman Beavers, all the guys. And then pretty much, it's unfortunate, but um, basically when Mark took the name, they basically said, okay, we got the other nine members, we got the sound, they dressing up in pirates, <laughs> costumes and everything. They, they're on another level with it, right, man. So right. you know, at some point, yeah, you know, I, you know, Mark has a group, and then they have a group, and it's unfortunate. You know, a lot of times the business can become uh, what it is, but you know, I do want to say that. You know, I do want to say that had it not been for Dick Griffey, and he is somebody that we must not ever forget. He goes down the way, um, you know, like you say, Barry Gordy, Leonard Chess, and just different people like that. And it really gives me a sense of pride, being a black man, that that brother in the 1980s was able to step out out there. Yeah. And remember, MTV was out. They wouldn't really necessarily play our videos and stuff like that. And he still made it happen. And then yeah. made it happen all the way into the 90s with the beginning of Death Row Records.